Thank you. Not a problem. Okay. So thank you for joining us. It's, technology is our friend and then sometimes not so much, but we always figure it out. Okay, so your decisions matter. It's a guide to beginning important conversations. We wanna make this conversational, even though we are on a Zoom platform. So I'm gonna encourage everybody to use the chat and Q&A. And I will ask some questions along the way. Um, but basically for the next hour, we wanna be able to discuss some techniques to initiate or facilitate having conversations about your healthcare wishes. We wanna define some of the documents that you can utilize to bring forth your wishes on paper, advanced directives and some other documents. Um, and then we wanna talk a little bit about how do you do that? Because some we do get a lot of questions. So really the first thing I wanted to talk, ask was if everybody could for a second in the chat, put in where you're from, like what are some of your interests? What do you hope to gain the information that you wanna to try to gain from the next hour? Because I wanna make sure that if we don't have it in our presentation that we address your, your questions. So why are you here today? What has, um, you know, what has prompted you to join us today? I, I would love to get some feedback from everybody. And I'm gonna give it a few seconds to let everybody find the chat and hopefully be able to answer. Rochelle, I can't really see the chat. Um, is there any comments in there? Uh huh. Hold on a second. Oh, I see them coming through. Okay. I'm just. Great. So, where you... so everyone, if you see at the very bottom middle of your screen, there should be a chat button. That's where you enter it. So now they're all coming in. Okay, great. So, you know, I see some some great comments here. Um, where do you file your advanced directive? Who should have it? The importance of having everything in place before it's too late. Um, to be able to offer guidance to clients or caregivers on how to start a conversation on sensitive issues and what the wording should be. So I think that these are all things that we're gonna, um, we're gonna address here. Perfect, thank you so much. So why do we need to start the conversation? I think that we spend a lot of time planning for things in our lives. Um, for me personally right now, you know, there's a, a baby that's coming on the way and there's a lot of preparation over months of time as to, you know, making sure that we have everything right, that um, everything is taken care of. But when we start to get sick, we don't always have these important conversations. And then when there's a crisis or things are changing, we have a lot of questions and everybody wants to make sure that they're doing the right thing. So the great thing is that we're living longer. We see more and more people that make that, that milestone of 100, 105, um, which is great. And we also have some lots of new technology. I mean, every day there's so much technology. It's amazing, new medications, um, treatments for things that there were never treatments before. But I think it's also important. And I, when I talk to people, they tell me that they wanna live good lives. They want to have quality. They want to be independent. They want to maintain um, a semblance of who they are. And so I think it's important to start the conversations for all of these reasons. And when we start to think about how do we do this, because it's hard, we, we want to focus on what matters most. We know that we cannot plan for everything, but we can talk about what's important in our lives, in our healthcare with those that would be helping to make those decisions. And I always see this as a gift because when there is a crisis and you're not able to provide that feedback, it's wonderful to know that there was at least a conversation prior. So I want you to take a moment again in the chat that if you had to think about what was the most important thing to you at this time, at, you know, whether you're 20, 40, 60, it's gonna change over time. And I think that that's important, but what would you consider to be most important for you right now? So I'm gonna give it a minute and have you guys go ahead and, and put some feedback in the chat. OK, 
Okay, so I see family and health is important. For some people, it might be independence. improving my health, having things in place for my family. Some people may say it's wealth. Some people may say it's making it to a family event. Um, you know, I do have a lot of family members who tell me that their loved ones told them they would never want to be in a nursing home type situation, that they always wanted to stay home. Some people love to eat. I always say I need a cup of coffee very important to me that I can have my cup of coffee. But of course, you know, there are degrees of things that are important. So some of the comments that I'm seeing, thank you so much for everybody for contributing to know that I will not be a burden to my kids when I'm no longer able to care for myself, improving my health, having things in place for my family. And those those are very important. So some of the things that you can ask yourself is what does a good day look like for you? You know, if I like to get up in the morning, have a cup of coffee, sit outside, is that okay? If I just like to watch television, if I was not as independent, but I could still participate with those around me, then that would be a good day. You know, if I could watch videos of my loved ones or Zoom with them now, right, that those would still be okay. Who supports you during difficult times? Who do you turn to on a regular basis? And, you know, unfortunately, some people don't have anybody um, that is very close to them, but is there a friend or a neighbor that if you were having a difficult time, would they be able to help you? And although I wanna always focus on having a good life and how I wanna spend my days, if my condition is worsening, then what matters to me through the end of my life? If I have a chronic illness that seems to be getting worse and things are not, um, the medications are not working the way that they used to, then what's gonna become important? And I mention this because when we'll talk about advanced directives, but sometimes as we complete these forms or we think about these, they're gonna change depending on where we are in the stages of our life. And what that means to me is that this is an ongoing conversation. I may think about it today, but a year from now, I may get a change in my medical status and I may have to think about it again. But at least you have something that you are, um, you have a baseline. So we've, you take some time and you think about it and now you have, you start to formulate a plan, then what next? What do you do? So the next thing you want to do is you want to plan your talk, right? Once you know what matters most to you, then who am I going to talk to? Do I need to talk to my doctors? Um, do I need to talk to that person who would be making decisions for me? As a, as a patient, do I want to know everything that's happening or only a little bit of information? Some family, some patients tell me to talk to their children, that they help them with all the decisions and they can't really grasp what's happening because it's so much. And so that's important for, for you to know that this is how you're going to, you know, um, work with this. And it's okay. There's no judgment. There's no right or wrong. It's really what works for you and your family. When there's a decision to be made? Do you want your health team, healthcare team to make most recommendations? Do you want your family members to be part of the discussion? Or are you the type of person that you plan everything, you have the information, and then you give it out to them? What are your, some of your concerns about the medical treatment? Um, and who would you talk to about? So those are all things that you would try to consider. And then once you have in, that in place, you wanna start talking. And we have some great guides there's the conversation starter um, and there's the conversation project, valleyhealth.com. If you go on that website and you type in advanced directive, it actually has all of the resources on there, but maybe we can also put it into the chat and I can do that a little bit later. And these are great to help you to start check off some of the things that you need to start planning and thinking about to then be able to give that information to those that matter most. And then we need to start talking and we need to practice to make it perfect. Now I'm going to attempt to show this video. Let's see if it works for me. So Rochelle, you have to let me know if it actually, might have to, sure. Okay. Are you able to see the little? Not yet. Okay. 
Do you see the YouTube screen or not really? Not yet. Okay. Well, Sorry, guys. If you struggle to lose weight, can you, you must hear me? see this. Can you hear it? No. I can hear the fact it, is but there's no poll has just been leaked. video. All right. I'm going to try to Mom. move it over. Maybe and... minimize your... Uh, there. Now it's yeah. loading. Okay, perfect. So this is a minute, so it won't take long. Okay. Still loading. Can you hear see it? Not yet. No. Okay. Still, still a gray screen. All right. So video because we had a little bit of a hard time with the video earlier. Um, but I could give the link. Basically, it's really that you have to practice because it's not easy to start these conversations. And sometimes you think about when do you start the conversation and how do you start the conversation. Um, and there are times that an event happens, somebody gets sick. And you may turn to a loved one and said, you know, if I was in this similar situation, this is what would be important to me. And I need you to know that. Um, because there are times that when we go to mention something that has to do with if I die, you sometimes will get people that are like, oh, don't talk about that. That's never going to happen. But we all know that at some point it may happen. We're just hoping that it's really far, far off in the future. And so we start to think about it and you can start off with just conversations about when somebody got sick or, you know, I noticed I saw something on TV. Um, I'm not uh, promoting any shows or anything, but I watched This Is Us and there's some been some great discussions on there about somebody who has advancing Alzheimer's and she sat the family down during Thanksgiving and said, you know, I need to let you know that this is what's important to me. And when that time comes, this is the person who's going to make decisions for me. And these are the types of the decisions that I would want. Um, so that was really, I think, helpful for the family. And then the next step is to consider writing it down on paper. And I know that sometimes we feel hesitant about writing something down on paper because when does it get put into effect? I know that there were some questions about the advanced directive and when does it get into effect? And Hillary is gonna talk about the advanced directive, but I wanna just make one point clear. An advanced directive is a guide for future use. Anybody over the age of 18 can complete it. Um, uh, and it doesn't always, it's not automatically implemented. So Hillary is gonna go over that. So I don't really wanna get into that too much. Um, but I think that this is a great time for us to, to share our poll. Um, so I do have a question because we are going to start talking now about the forms and I'm going to hand it over to Hillary. But I wanted everybody, if you could just answer the question, do you have an advanced directive? And for those of you who may not know what it is, it's that piece of paper that designates who the person would be to make decisions for you and, and what those decisions would be. So I'm going to give you a second to vote. I think we have a few more people who have it. Okay, voted. I can't see what's going on with the yeah. poll. But, so there you go. I think they're all in. Okay, and let me share the results. Perfect. Wow, this is great. 90% of the people on here have an advanced directive. And I couldn't vote, but I have one too. So um, I have one as well. <laughs> okay. Okay, perfect. Okay, so with that, we're going to talk about now, you know, so we talked a little bit about how to start these conversations. And now once we have the conversations, now we want to get these on paper. So I'm going to hand it over to Hillary. All right. Hello, everybody. Um, I will be up front and tell you all that I do not have an advanced directive. I'm a little embarrassed to say. However, I um, recently uh, got a proxy directive, a durable power of attorney from uh, a neighbor of mine uh, who asked us, to, my husband and me, to uh, witness his um, 
advance directive for he and his wife, and he made me a copy very kindly. So I am going to be doing this with my husband, um, and you know, discussing um, discussing with my family. Um, but what I wanted to say was, you know. This, um, I'm in my 60s, and you know, when I was maybe in my 40s and my 50s, I was very much aware of it, an advanced directive as I, you know, I've been in healthcare for some years, and I um, would be asked, I think all of us, when we go to, you know, have any kind of a test at the hospital, like a mammogram or um, an x ray or a, an ER visit, you know, the staff always asks you, do you have an advanced directive? And, um, you know, my answer has always been, well, no. And then I think kind of guiltily, gosh, I really do need to discuss this with my family. And I think that, you know, all of you that are listening today can kind of relate to that feeling of, I really need to have this important conversation. Um, and just as you see me was talking, it's, you know, it's making time for that conversation, you know, thinking about what you want for yourself and then actually setting time aside. Um, and it's like so important to do that. Um, it's really, uh, it's, it's almost like maintenance on your home. It's, it's like something you shouldn't put off. It's maintenance on your life that you really need to um, address of what matters to you. Um, uh, so I do plan in my <laughs> in the near future to sit down and fill out um, an advanced directive. So, um, you know, what is an advanced directive? Basically, uh, as you can see on the slide, first step is um, um, you, you really need to approach the advanced directive when you are a healthy and independent person. Um, you know, quite often we don't do it when we're fully healthy, but, and, and maybe some sort of an illness kind of either in our family or if, you know, personally triggers us to realize, you know, we really do need to start filling this out. Um, and certainly for any of you who have older family members or ill family members, um, maybe you've gone through the, you know, the demise, like the, the long-term illness of a, of a parent, um, you know, you're pretty aware that, that this is something that you need to address for yourself um, and for your, for your loved ones, frankly, so that you know what they, they want. Um, in our palliative care uh, field, we often come up with, um, we, we meet many family members who, you know, we ask them, what do they want for their loved one? You know, their, this, their mom is, you know, how now had a stroke and she can no longer speak. And they, you know, many times will turn and say, well, oh my gosh, I really don't know. I, you know, we never, we just never got around to having this conversation. It was just so painful to, to discuss. Um, so that's why, you know, that's why I mentioned as um, this very important to, to have that conversation and, you know, talk about if something happened. So the first thing you need to do is, is come up with um, your, um, let me just see if that's the next page, the person that you would like to name as your healthcare representative. Um, would it be, you know, your spouse, um, a child, um, a sibling, um, a very close friend, somebody who you can trust to make um, a decision for you in the event that you're not able to, for some reason, you know, not able to make your own decision. Um, is that on the next, next slide? Um, yeah, it's so, so it's the proxy directive. So that's a form that you can fill out. I think we have, may have an example at the end. Um, we can send a link, there we go. Um, choosing a healthcare representative. So you're gonna designate someone. This does not have to be filled out with a lawyer. This can be printed off um, the internet and you can designate a um, representative and then two other alternate representatives. Uh, maybe maybe you have a spouse and then children or you have a sibling, um, even a, a very close friend that you would trust. Um, and then um, you can specify towards the bottom of the page um, 
Yes, you need to, you see me mentioning this, you need to have copies, exactly. And I think there was a question earlier from someone, how does Valley know what my what my advanced directive says? You really do need to have a copy with you. Um, it's great to have one, you know, with your lawyer, great to have one in a safety deposit box, that's fine. But you really need, need to have a copy that's, you know, on your desk at home, um, on your fridge if need be, so that when you do go to the hospital, you bring a copy with you or your loved one can bring a copy and then we will uh, at the hospital we will scan it into your chart and it will be there uh, forever <laughs> um, we will have a copy of it it's always accessible to um, anyone that's involved in your care um, can you have a copy on your phone um, I don't think that's a bad idea I don't think there's I don't know if you see me if you know I can't imagine that that's um, as long as it you can be you know pull up a document and um, someone can read it absolutely you can yeah. have a copy on your phone um, sometimes people have saved pdf files on their phones now and they will forward them to us and we'll print them and have them entered into your medical record right. so that it stays on file from visit to visit right and like I said, it doesn't have to go through your, you know, I, I've had so many family members say, oh, well, I've got to get in touch with my lawyer because, you know, he or she has it in their files and I don't have a copy. That's great, but it, it is an extra step now that you're going to have to take to get that copy. So, and, and it doesn't have to be with your lawyer. Not everybody has a lawyer. Um, you can have this just sitting on your fridge or in your, your husband's wallet or wherever. Um, so you are going to then give uh, instructions to that representative and you'll see additional um, sections on, yes, um, I, I will allow you to make the determination as to whether to withhold CPR um, or you can not check that box and say, no, you know, I'm not going to give my, my um, healthcare proxy uh, that that decision making capacity, but um, you do you may you know you want to be specific about what you would or would not want your representative to be able to decide for you. Um, and, and Hillary, then, can I just sorry? Absolutely I, no. Somebody had asked a question about when does the advanced directive actually go into effect? Right. So very good question. The the proc the advanced directive goes into a, in effect when you can no longer make a decision for your for your own health care. Um, so that would be if you um, had a stroke and couldn't speak, um, if you were critically ill and um, were sedated, um, if you had advanced um, if you had dementia and could no longer uh, make decisions for yourself. Um, so very a, a lot of different situations. Um, you could be in a terrible uh, an accident, you know, God forbid. But you you could, um, you know, have a brain injury and you're unable to decide something for yourself. Or you know maybe you're going to get better, but at least for a period of time you're unable to make any kind of decision because you are, you know, you're unconscious or you're you're, um, you know, you're incapacitated. So, um, so the advanced directive would be the proxy directive naming someone uh, to make decisions for you and uh, would be the first thing to fill out and and you want to do that when you're, you know, you're hopefully you're still healthy, you can think about what you'd want and really have a conversation with those people that you've designated about what your wishes are. Um, they can always take a form that you've you've filled out and interpret it, but it would be much better if you could have the conversation while you're um, you're still competent and um, you know speak with your loved one um, so that they know what your what your wishes are. Now the next the next form, and this is a form that we use very frequently in the hospital, and some of you may have heard of it or seen it. It's usually a green form, at least in New Jersey. It's called a POLST. And that stands for Practitioner's Orders for Life-Sustaining Treatment, as you can see on the screen. Um, this is a form that, um, as, it, as is indicated on, you can read, it's really for someone with a serious illness um, or for someone, I would say, over a certain age, maybe a, a quite an elderly person that um, is starting to have some health problems. Not even a super healthy uh, elder, elderly person, unless maybe they're, 
they've somehow skated through and they're, you know, 95 years old, but they, they realize that um, they're not going to live forever. And they really don't want any sort of serious um, uh, medical interventions, you know, um, uh, invasive medical interventions toward the end of their life. So the POLST form um, is really a, a, a great uh, means of indicating what your preferences are um, or for your, your loved one who might be older, maybe you have an older um, parent or an aunt. Um, and the first section is a goals of care area where you're going to just talk about what matters most to you. And I've had some pretty interesting goals of care that I've filled out with people. Um, I've had some hundred, near 100 year olds who just wanted to make their 100th birthday. I had a lady who had two weeks to go and that was her goal. She wanted to live to 100 and she did make it. Um, I've had some recently um, older folks in their 90s that wanted to make uh, make it to a wedding. Um, and actually we kind of had to readdress it because it was not looking like she'd make it to the wedding, which was months away. But they, um, she said, well, you know, if I could just get to my, my granddaughter's bridal shower, I would be happy. So we put that on her goals of care. Um, the second section, uh, section B, Oh, and one thing I should tell you is the reverse side of the POLST form has a, like a instructions for filling out um, each section. So um, when you do look at that online, um, you'll see some more specific instructions to help guide you. But the second section is medical interventions. Um, this is a little bit more of a gray area that can kind of take some... Um, thinking and talking with family members. Do you want full treatment? Um, which means do everything you possibly can to keep me alive. Um, with the possible exception below in the in the section D on CPR and airway management, which would be whether you wanted to be resuscitated with chest compressions or put on a ventilator if need be, if you could no longer breathe for yourself. But um, medical interventions, uh, going back to section B, um, you know, do you want full, full on treatment or, and a lot of people kind of, as they get older, I find they want the limited treatment. They'll say, well, I want to be alive and I want you to do everything, pretty much everything you could for me, but like, don't do anything crazy. You know, don't put it, don't put a lot of tubes in me or, you know, don't, 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 uh, don't give me painful interventions, you know, give me kind of the ones that are not going to hurt too much, like antibiotics, IV fluids, things like that, um, a mask of oxygen. Um, so you can be specific there under the limited treatment. And then symptom treatment only. Um, I do see people checking that off. That's really more of a hospice. Um, when you're ready for hospice, you just want to be kept, com kept comfortable. You really don't want any interventions that are meant to keep you alive for any particular, you know, fix any problem. You just want to really be comfortable at the end of your life. And there's a section additional orders where you can be very specific. Um, I had one person that said, um, just, I don't want antibiotics. Um, at the, you know, just, that's one thing I don't want. Um, and then um, the section below D is the CPR. Um, that's the DNR. Um, kind of the very basic, um, something that you would be asked if you, when you come in through the emergency room, the doctor or the nurse or someone seeing you first, which should be asking you, you know, do you want us to be resuscitate you if, if anything happens, if your heart stops, um, or do you want to have a natural death? Um, and that's actually indicated in that section, allow natural death. Um, and one thing we do emphasize to patients um, is that you, um, you know, if you require CPR, if your heart stops, essentially you, you have suffered a cardiac death. So your heart's no longer working. Um, you would still have brain, your brain may still be living and, and you have brain waves, um, but essentially you're already dead. So when we do CPR, we are kind of bringing you back um, and reestablishing your heartbeat. So um, that's just something to think about. And then airway management, um, we're all unfortunately hearing a lot about airway management because of the COVID pandemic. And, and you know, there's been just a tremendous amount 
of um, exposure to people seeing ventilators. Um, so I think everybody's somewhat aware of what a ventilator is. Um, a ventilator is a machine that's going to breathe for you. And uh, until hopefully maybe your condition reverses and the doctors and, and nurses can wean you off of the ventilator and allow you to, once your body starts breathing on its own. Um, so, and then um, section E, basically you're giving your surrogate decision maker who would be the person you're gonna list um, below as a surrogate. Um, and that would be most likely your, your healthcare proxy that you've filled out if you've done your, um, your proxy directive, your durable power of attorney for healthcare. Um, that would be the person that um, you would either give them permission to make changes to this if you were unable, if you were unconscious or incompetent, um, or you say, no, I, I want you to follow this to the letter. I don't want you making changes. So that would be, you know, a, a conversation you would ha should have with that person um, if possible. Um, and then signatures. This can be signed by anyone. Um, Oh, question. Does someone need an advanced directive and a post? So, I'll, you know, that's a very good question that will lead me into my next topic. Um, this can be signed by the by your physician, by a nurse practitioner, by a, um, a physician assistant, anyone that has a, a professional license. Um, power of attorney. Um, this the yes yes good question so a lot of times we do fill out pulse forms for people who are unable to sign for themselves um it's quite often the pulse gets filled out you know toward the end of life it's not always filled out in advance so yes you um you would sign here where it says signature um you would could print your your uh the person's name and then you're going to sign your name and then fill out yes i am the healthcare representative legal guardian spouse whatever whatever um whoever however you're related to the person um, Sorry, can i chime in a second yes as well? sorry sure. um so i just want to clarify the so you don't need to have an advanced directive and a post. Right. The, the advanced directive is anybody over the age of 18 who has decision making capacity can complete an advanced directive for future use. And when you look in an advanced directive, it's very vague sometimes as to the wording, yeah. um, as to when it would be put into effect. For many people, it's if they have a terminal or irreversible illness, if they're unresponsive, um, if they're not able to really make decisions and they have a poor prognosis, they're not expected to survive, or if you had a very severe injury, but you were gonna survive, but it would be not be good quality of life for you. Um, and so it never gets automatically put into place because I think that was another question that was asked. It would always be a conversation with your medical team as to how you're doing and what your prognosis, how you're expected to do um, when everything, you know, after you're with whatever's happening. Right. This, this form is more specific because it is an actionable order that's portable. So no matter where you go, if you're in rehab, if you're home, if you're in the hospital, right. we Thank honor it as a medical order. That. Yeah. So not Thank everybody you. needs to have a pulse form, right. but usually they complement each other. Okay. Right. And, um, and yeah. Yeah. And so say, in that in that setting, then if the person is no longer able to make decisions for themselves, then the power of attorney or the healthcare representative can complete a post form in, uh -huh. as their surrogate. But an advanced directive can only be completed by the person. Right. I ahead of time. Correct. Correct. Right, and um, there was just a question about whether the um, person who signs the advanced, who is named as the healthcare proxy on the an advanced directive, it has to be the same person that's on the post. Um, and I don't, I don't believe that that's the case. Do you know, you see me? If that could be a birth different person. So um, for so power of attorney is a, another that could that's a different. So power of attorney for financial, there's different types of power of attorneys. Right. You can have power of attorney for finances, and that doesn't really cover the healthcare. healthcare. If you are a healthcare representative or you have a durable power of attorney for healthcare, then that would be the person that would be signing the signing. form. 
the form. Okay. Right. But there's a lot of confusion sometimes because people will come in and say, well, I'm the power of attorney, but you can have somebody who, who's in charge of the finances. So sometimes people will put like one child in charge of the finances and one child in charge of the medical the medical. Right. right. So then we would be looking for the medical. And so we always do look at that advanced directive to say, who is the healthcare representative? Right. And sometimes they can be the same person. Right. But we will look for the healthcare representative. Right. Does that answer the person's question that was in the chat? Um, Hillary, was there more of the pulse that you were reviewing? Sorry, I wanted to make sure that those questions were answered. No, that was that was where where I was going with that too. Okay. So we do we do have a lot of questions from people about. Well, I have an advanced. It's all in my advanced directive. Yeah, but that that's different than you know. That's only in the case of as you were just saying, uh, you know, when someone um, has a, maybe a terminal illness or you know things are are nearing the end, that. Um, it's not as um, it's a, it's sort of a little vaguer and is more to be interpreted by your, your the physician uh, as to where you are on that trajectory as opposed to the pulsed, which really um, oh one th one section that I forgot to mention and I sorry about that is artificially administered fluids and nutrition um, and that's I can't believe I forgot that it's a very important section. Um, that and as you see me was mentioning before, you know, she wants to be able to have coffee, you know, um, and I don't want a feeding tube. And my husband knows this. And I've told him many times, I do not want artificial nutrition. If I can no longer eat, then that's it. I'm done. Um, so that's a, an important section to fill out um, about the artificial nutrition, um, which is often, um, you know, something that toward the end of life, people become unable to eat. Um, they may not be interested in eating any longer, especially if they have a, you know, a dementia um, or just they don't care about eating. They're, they're kind of on that trajectory toward the end of their lives. Um, the, the other thing, too, with this form is that it has to be signed by your medical provider. Um, right. You know, where an advanced directive, you can have those two witnesses or a healthcare proxy. This, oh, right. beca because there is more into this, right? Now, these are orders that are going to be carried out. There should be a discussion with your medical team, whether it's a nurse practitioner, a physician, or a physician assistant. And in order for this form to be valid, it does have to be signed by the patient or that representative and the healthcare provider. provider right. So that the, you know, it'll be a discussion about what your medical condition is and what would be helpful and beneficial and what might not be as much, and then what you choose so that it is really a comprehensive picture of your medical treatment plan. Right. Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna change the slide here. Um, and, and really, I think we wanna focus on, on you being able to do this, right? Being on that mobility scooter and getting around. Um, I thought that this was a cute, a cute cartoon um, that we want to try to focus on making people feel better, live better, live better, longer lives. But when things start to get a little bit more complicated, we want to make sure that there are conversations that are being had. Um, so now we do open it up for questions. I think we've tried to answer everybody's question that's on here. But does anybody have any additional questions or um, Rochelle, were there any questions in the Q&A? There's no questions entered right now, but you can, you can enter it um, for all of our attendees. If you have any questions, please enter it in the Q&A. I'm just looking through. I did post the link to the YouTube video that I was trying to share um, on here. And I'm going to also share the link to the Valley um, Advanced Care Planning page that, you know, that this is a term that we use advanced care planning, but what does that mean? It's really everything that we've talked about today. Um, and so on there, there are some, some references to the conversation project, which I mentioned. And um, there's also another different advanced directive, uh, five wishes that we didn't really cover. The one that we shared is the one that's most common, but there's some additional references that you can use on this, on this site. Oh, okay. So there's a question about, I was confused by who should sign. Um, 
so uh, the advanced directive does have to be signed by you um but and then you're appointing some a proxy so then the person on right so you're going to hereby designate and then you're going to have two witnesses um who would not be the would not be the proxy it has to be someone else um and because you're appointing someone to make decisions for you if you have you know any as it says i may come a time when i'm diagnosed with an incurable or irreversible illness injury disease or condition um so i think is your question then that does the same person who signs the pulsed form need to be this one of the the healthcare proxy that is named um i think just for clarification i think he was asking about the physician signature because the pulsed is an order form Correct. So the oh, okay. Yeah. So the pulse the question. Yeah. So the pulse. So two different forms that we talked right. about. The pulsed form, because it is a a portable medical order, medical order, does require that a doctor or nurse practitioner or physician assistant sign it sign along it. with the patient or the healthcare proxy. And so this is a form that's usually meant for somebody who has a serious illness who now has a lot more limitations maybe to the treatments and they want to make sure that if they come to the hospital or they're in a at home and they have to call 911 that this gets carried out. Right. And this um, that pulsed also should be um, as as you see me was saying it's transportable so it it can um, it would be you can have a copy at home on the fridge and in fact it's a really good idea if someone is quite you know is quite elderly infirm let's say they have a DNR you want them to have a DNR um, and a DNI you don't want them resuscitated if it's in a very obvious place like the fridge that's where the EMTs would look actually I used to do that myself you would. Um, and if they see that this form is there and they see that the person is a DNR, they will not do CPR. They will allow a natural death. And, and um, it's, it's actually, this has happened. It's, it's important to have that. Um, then the form is also filed at Valley. Um, if they go to a rehab or a hospice facility, anywhere they might go, um, the copy goes with them. So it's it's basically on file everywhere that where the the patient might be um, get receiving any kind of care. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to go back to the advanced directive for a second. Um, so the advanced directive, you can designate more than one representative, and this one can be witnessed. So you don't need right. to have a doctor's signature. Right. 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 So there were two different forms that we talked about. This one is more general and does not need a doctor's signature. And then the post form is does need a doctor's signature. Right. So I think that answers the question of one of the attendees. Yes. If you have, you can have two representatives, you can have up to three representatives. And normally what happens is that you would, um, you go to the first representative and then if that first representative is not available or not able to provide that, you know, be the surrogate, then we go to the second. And second then one. after that, we would go to the third. Right. Yeah. And is there a different pulse for different states? Great question. And yes, there are. The United States being the United States, everybody's very yeah. independent. So New York has a most medical orders for life sustaining treatment. Some people have a post. We have a pulse. Um, and so just the wording is different. The one thing is that for some states that we are able to honor that form. So if somebody comes from New York, Pennsylvania, we will honor the form. It's not the same in all states. So sometimes it does make it difficult that if you have some people who travel from one state to the other, they may need to have two forms. Um, so for instance, Pennsylvania does not honor the New Jersey post. So if you went to Pennsylvania, you would probably, you know, if you had a, a, someone who had one of those forms, then you would, but an advanced directive is universal. So no matter where you go, most states, you know, all states will honor an advanced honor. directive. Mm -hmm. These are some great questions. Oh. Thank you, everybody. They're very thoughtful questions. The POLST is called a MOLST, M-O-L-S-T in New York for that. Yes, so I'll, yeah. I'll, type, I'll type it in there for them. Okay. And it's a pink form where right. in New Jersey, the form it's is green. green 
and they're all meant so they would stand out, but copies of any of these, right? So sometimes like, I think Hillary had mentioned that the lawyer will have the advanced directive or people put it in their safety deposit box in the bank. But then when you come into the hospital, especially if it's on a Sunday, you can't get to it. Right. And so we normally would recommend that you have multiple copies because we can accept copies yeah. of the form and you keep your original. Right. I think Does there was it, a question earlier if you can have copies on your phone. Yes, yeah. and you can have it on your phone or in person. You know, sometimes sure. people have a file with all their medical records. I'm sure that there are apps now that you can keep important forms. Um, I know that on my iPhone, you can actually scan documents under notes. So huh. I, I have my father's advanced directive on there because if there was ever any problems, wow. I could email it to any doctor or, or a hospital so that I have it readily available. Yeah. Yes, and we do email forms back and forth also to, to families. That's acceptable and- um, Under, in HIPAA compliant um, emails. HIPAA compliant emails, that's <laughs> true. Not just, uh, yeah, not personal yeah. email, but the, uh, the hospital email, right. <laughs> All right, does anybody else have any questions? You can type them in. Anything that you want to reinforce before we end the presentation? You see me or Hillary? I, I added some of the links um, on the chat and um, you know, one for the video and one for the advanced care planning, which I mentioned has everything on there. Um, so I wanna thank everybody. Really, it's been a, a great yeah. discussion, even though not in person, and, yeah. but through the chat. Thank you, I really yeah, do appreciate you. it. It makes a difference. Yeah, thank Thanks you for so participating.